Previously on The Secret Life of Death, Episode 6, Awe, Part 1. We began the episode by immersing ourselves in the effects of the good and special art on the gravestone of Relief Wilcox Town. Relief is an old friend of The Secret Life of Death. She was the subject of Episode 3, Relief, where I discussed the origins of her name. But here, in Episode 6, we're looking at her gravestone. Specifically, the incredible art design on the tympanum. It's of the night sky. Across the top, a crescent moon with a human face in profile. Situated amongst an arc of ten stars, and at the bottom, a broken willow tree. All of those elements have been pushed to the periphery, however, deliberately manipulating the center of the scene to show only empty space. Oh, wow. Oh, oh my God. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow, oh my God, and whoa, indeed. In part one, we also learned that historic gravestones in cemeteries from late 18th, early 19th century New England are full of literal and symbolic clues that reflect important societal influences. Everything from what designs are presented on a gravestone to where and how a cemetery and town are laid out all speak to cultural, religious, and personal preferences. And by understanding how all of those things change over time, we can learn how to read the images on Relief's gravestone and others, kind of like Egyptian hieroglyphs. Those images and other clues tell a story about the people in those graves in their time. What will we learn about Relief from her gravestone? Well, hold on to your butts. I'm Gail Golick, and this is The Secret Life of Death, Episode 6, Awe, Part 2. Historic gravestone art in New England, especially the time period we're working with for this show, the late 18th, early 19th century, really runs the gamut. We see flowers and coffins and angels and willows and skulls and suns. It's a wild variety. Based on a mix of long-standing cultural traditions, the individual artistic style of the carver, and the personal preferences of those placing the order, often resulting in a hodgepodge of symbolic and literal imagery. All of that variety makes for an exciting study, but can leave your head swirling as to what it's all supposed to mean. Here's where seriation comes in handy. By knowing the sequence of stylistic changes over time for a particular type of object, we can not only tell its relative age, we can also understand and contextualize the influences that brought about those changes. So we need to set you up with a brief evolution of New England gravestone motif design. And if you thought we were having fun before, well, we're gonna have more fun because I really do think this is fun. Anyway. The earliest gravestone design motifs in New England were influenced by some of its earliest Anglo-American settlers, the Puritans. They tended to view life's trials and virtues in rather heavy-handed binary terms. Good or evil, salvation or damnation, life or death. And death was viewed as inevitable, absolute, and to be endured by all equally, with no pomp and circumstance required. This 
This is reflected in the popularity of literal mortality symbols in the main motif designs on gravestones. From the late 1600s to the 1750s, we see skulls, bones, skeletons, coffins, scythes, and hourglasses as main design motifs, situated in that curved dome of the tympanum. Secondary designs along the sides of the tablet ranged from simple and geometric to elaborate fruit, vine, and vegetable elements. By the 1780s, the country had just finished fighting for its independence and had settled into a post-revolution malaise. Thomas Jefferson's ideals that the only life worth living was that of reason and stoic individualism, easy for an independently wealthy white man with 600 slaves to say, somehow fell flat with the general populace. The vast number of people wanted more and turned to religion, resulting in waves of evangelical revivals centering around a more gentle, individual relationship with God and the world. By the mid-18th century, gravestone art motif designs reflect that change of focus to a benevolent God and resurrection and life everlasting. The devils and skulls begin to soften and morph into stylized skull-angel combinations known as soul effigies, or more commonly, winged skulls. These are simplified, two-dimensional, frontal-view skull figures with wings protruding from the neck or emanating around the sides of the face, representing a soul's literal flight into the heavens. Many different gravestone carvers produced their own version of this winged skull soul effigy. But there's a particular regional style of winged skull originating around central Connecticut that's worth mentioning because it's a great illustration of how something like gravestone carving can clue us in on population migrations. This central Connecticut style of winged skull is a strange mix of skeletal and flesh features. The view of the effigy is head-on, and its features are carved in a two-dimensional outline. There's a general skull shape to the head, but it has eyeballs, eyebrows, a bulbous nose, and has bared skull teeth, which, instead of being placed right below the nose, sit at the very bottom of the chin, represented by a short, squiggly line. It also has a pair of wings that swing up from the base of the skull and fan out around both sides of the face. And sometimes there's a stylized wig or crown on the top of its head. It's a true hybrid of the forms that preceded it, an anatomical human skull, and followed it, the winged angels. One such carver in that style, Gershom Bartlett, is known for his distinctive take on the sole effigy winged skull motif, known as the hook and eye, as the eyes and the eyebrows resemble hooks. These exaggerated facial features of Bartlett's hook and eye style conspire to create a rather goofy expression on the face of the effigy, as if it's just been goosed. So, it stands out in a field of gravestones, making it easy to identify, and therefore, to study. Bartlett had a shop in Windsor, Connecticut in the mid-1700s. He was a prolific carver, and his work began to show up in towns all around Windsor. But by the late 1770s, his weird, gremlin-faced soul effigy suddenly stops in Connecticut and instead started showing up in and around Norwich, Vermont, where he had moved. Bartlett was prolific in his new home in Vermont as well. Today, there are over 300 known stones throughout the upper Connecticut River Valley of Vermont and New Hampshire attributed to his shop. And because his distinctive goosed soul effigy shows up in two separate areas of New England, 
It shows how gravestone art can track population migrations and the transmission of culture between early settlements. But most early towns weren't lucky enough to draft a resident master carver like Bartlett as they did in Norwich, Vermont. So what was a town with only a handful of houses and few residents, some of whom were dead and in need of a gravestone, to do? These far-flung places relied on itinerant craftspeople who came through once or twice a year and took care of all the projects people in town needed attending to. And those early craftspeople, which included masons, roofers, cordwainers, saddle makers, and wood carvers, often moonlighted as gravestone carvers as well, cutting stones for people on their way through. They would have been natural choices to take on occasional gravestone carving work, as they would be familiar with the methods for working stone and would already have the hand tools necessary for the job. By the 1790s, populations in the upper Connecticut River Valley were such that they could support full-time craftspeople. Shops dedicated to gravestone carving were established, giving those artisans time to develop their own identifiable styles, or schools, apart from established carvers like Gershom Bartlett. One such school of carvers, with their own distinctive tradition, was based in Rockingham, Vermont, known as the Wright School. As I mentioned in part one of episode six, the Rockingham Meeting House is the perfect classroom for studying 18th century New England town settlement, or as the U's call it these days, the post-French and Indian War population migrations and secondary town settlement patterns of the central New England uplands. Kids and their crazy pop culture references this National Register Historic Landmark is a showcase of 18th century New England culture, not only because of the meeting house, but because of the burying ground out back. By the 1770s, places like Rockingham, Vermont, were still sparsely settled. But with the cessation of hostilities that plagued the area during the French and Indian War, 1754 to 1763, Rockingham and other fledgling towns were slowly growing in population and expanding their basic amenities beyond roads, mills, and log homes. All of that infrastructure had to be started from scratch, making most early incarnations scaled down and simplified. We can tell that not only from the stark architecture of the meeting house, but from the style and type of decoration we see on the gravestones from that era. Hard, scrabble lives reflected in efficient, economical folk art. Oh, wow, look at him. It really does look like a sign. But make no mistake, it is out. art. And little lines that look like radiating heat, and then you've got two kinds of trees. Yeah. My friend, Teresa Janison, and I Unless are out at the Rockingham feathers, Meeting House on a sunny January morning picking our way through the melting snow in the burying ground, looking for some of its most notable stones. Those done by Rockingham's own Wright School gravestone carvers. Oh, there's one. The Wright School is a group of nine craftspeople with interrelated styles from three different shops around the upper Connecticut River Valley. It was active for about 30 years, between 1790 and 1817. Researchers have put together this history based on similarities in the carver's styles, ads for their shops found in newspapers at the time, and the fact oh, that some of the carvers signed it's their work. huge, but it's laid down on the ground, and the carving goes all the way, and it's... Ah, they signed it! <laughs> Made by M. Wright. And it's got that geometric... This style diamonds. likely originated in the shop of All Moses the Wright Jr. in Rockingham. The other carvers either directly apprenticed with him or apprenticed with carvers who studied there at some point, hence their stylistic similarities. 
These designs generally include practical secondary elements that were simple to lay out with nothing more than a drawing compass. Geometric shapes, pinwheels, swirls, stylized flowers, hearts, and most notably, their sole effigy figures. The figure doesn't look very happy. <laughs> it's got just this, just two indentations for the lips, but they're, they're pointed downward. Yeah. Very frowny. Mm-hmm. Sad Muppet. Sad Muppet. <laughs> With this kind of... In the same way the goosed expression on Gershom Bartlett's winged skulls stands out, so too do the little Muppety faces created by the carvers of the Wright School. Their faces are symmetrically round, with resigned, derpy expressions on their faces. The carving work itself is generally very shallow, and always done on slate, creating a flat, two-dimensional human face, with eyes, eyebrows, nose, and mouth, each with the telltale, perfectly round face. Depending on the artist, the individual style of the face varied. Sometimes it was just a face, floating by itself within the tympanum. Sometimes a face with a bust, a powdered wig, period clothing, and or set into a rectangular coffin. Sometimes the face was made into a sun, with rays coming out around the head, or it had wings like an angel. Sorry, I can't. Oh, there's a sun! Oh, there's three suns! Look! The Wright's faces, like all effigies, were meant to be portraits of the deceased, but were not meant to be an exact likeness of the person, just a representation. They were generic human forms. Man, woman, child, all looked the same, but might differ in size. For instance, when a mother and child shared a stone, the child's portrait would be smaller. Twin, oh... Oh. So in this case, you've got the mother and two twins. Sacred to the memory of Betty Lane, who died June 22nd, 1791, in the 34th year of her age, and also her twins, one stillborn, the other aged three days. Aww. So I'm assuming they all probably died. With a face or portrait serving as the main motif on the tympanum, there were a number of secondary motifs that came into fashion in the region. Some were carryovers from an earlier era. Bones, hourglasses, coffins, all symbols of death. But we also begin to see that harsh realism being traded for gentler, allegorical symbols of resurrection and the heavens. Things like hearts, flowers, vines, fruits, willows, celestial bodies, stars, moons, and suns. Many of the elements, remember, that figure prominently in the stone we talked about at the opening of the show. The stars, willow, and crescent moon on the stone of relief Wilcox Town, whose crescent moon had a human face in profile. Yet again, another variation on the soul effigy. At the turn of the 19th century, gravestone art had its trends and popular styles, but there was still a lot of regional variability. But by around 1810, the two biggest and most enduring changes in gravestone art started cropping up. The switchover from carving stones out of slate to exclusively from white marble, and the rise in popularity of the urn and willow motif. Both of these changes correlate to a wider cultural phenomenon, the Greek Revival Period, which, as its name suggests, repopularized elements of not only ancient Greek, but Roman and Egyptian architectural and artistic elements. This design revival was an outgrowth of a country trying to define itself as a solid democratic republic. And what better way to do that than to model itself functionally and physically after the earliest and most revered republics, 
the Greeks and the Romans. This is a time when state and federal capital cities were constructing their major capital buildings with freestanding domes and pillared colonnades constructed out of da, 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 white marble. All this marble being mined for these new construction projects made it an economical option for the general population for other uses, like the carving of gravestones. The willow in these designs was, of course, a weeping willow, whose name and image are the perfect embodiment of sadness and mourning. The urns were another nod to mortality, drawing on the practice of the ancient Greeks of placing cremated human remains in urns. Sometimes, instead of an urn, there was a chalice, which looked a lot like an urn, but was flat across the top. It often had a flame dancing inside, representing the flicker of everlasting life. The urn slash chalice and willow design had a pretty standard layout in the tympanum. The urn or chalice was placed at the center of the scene, and the trunk of the willow tree on one side with branches curving up and over the urn or chalice, then hanging loose on the other side. There were a lot of interpretations of this motif, some quite detailed and lifelike, and others very vague and impressionistic. And during the early years of this design transition, often there's a combination of the older tradition with the newer. For instance, a willow draped over a soul effigy in place of an urn. At this same time, other Greek-inspired imagery became popular for the secondary designs on the shoulder and on the tablet of the gravestone. Columns, tassels, banners, drapery, and various styles of background shading. Then a little later still, the introduction of Egyptian-inspired imagery. Overall, gravestones became larger, sleeker, more elaborate, and more uniform, with the rounded shoulders being replaced by square-cut shoulders. After 1820, the conversion to the willow in urn is almost complete, and gone are all the sole effigy figures. Gravestones, by and large, would still have an extra inscription at the bottom of the tablet, but they're more often poems or biblical verses, and don't tend to include the kind of personal information they once did. By 1830, the transition from slate to marble is complete, though there are some rural pockets where the slate hangs on a bit longer. Between the 1820s and the 1830s, the willow in urn motif became so popular, it eclipsed all others. By mid-century, carving shops were becoming mechanized, more professional, standardized. And that's reflected in the increasing lack of variety of motif and carving styles during this time. Gone are the local or itinerant carvers. Most stones were produced in large shops that had catalogs where people from far away ordered from a stack of pre-made stones. Instead of the layout and the lettering being drawn freehand, they had templates and machinery that helped do the carving. By the 1850s, the whole profile of the stone gets squared off and simplified. The design may be just a willow, an urn at the top, or a hand pointing up, or a bouquet of flowers with some minor flourishes down the sides. But there are no longer any personalized poems or biblical inscriptions at the bottom of the tablet. Overall, stones become plain rectangles, with just name, date of, and age at death. Efficiency uniformity, less personalization, are all the hallmarks of an increasingly mechanized society. 
And what's happening around 1850? The railroads. Large-scale mill operations, all calling people away from their small towns and centralizing the population in cities. The fabric and function of society was changing incredibly fast and in big ways. Who would have thought you could learn all that from a little old gravestone? Let's again consider the stone we talked about at the opening of the show. That of Relief Wilcox Town and its impressive, unique, and awe-inspiring art. Oh, wow. Oh, oh my God. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Where does all that fit in with what we now know? Her stone, dating from 1813, falls into this very interesting in-between period, one where local stone carvers were still producing sole effigy motifs, but were in the process of transitioning to some elements of the Greek revival movement of neoclassical art and architecture. But instead of there being a winged angel or a goofy little muppet face in the tympanum, there is instead a cluster of celestial objects. The moon with the human face in profile as a soul effigy, and ten stars. All referring to a heavenly ascent of the soul. Then there's the willow tree, used to signify mourning. But instead of standing draped over a mourning figure or an urn, here it's broken and fallen off to the side. The moon, stars, and willow were all common enough elements in 1813. But the deliberate and personal nature of the carving and the show that's made of their layout are what really make this stone special. Instead of centralizing the images in the tympanum, as per usual, the artist pushes them all off to the periphery, making the focal point the empty space. That's a really sophisticated, abstract concept. And it's all very different from anything I've ever seen in this area of Vermont and New Hampshire. Not homegrown, like the art of those from the Wright School of Carvers, for sure. But we know from art of carvers like Gershom Bartlett and his goosed soul effigies that gravestone art can follow an artist. But again, this is the only stone like it in this area I've ever seen. And the same goes for every other person in the know I've asked around here. So where did it come from? There is so much to this design and a lot about it I don't quite understand. Yet. Special thanks for this episode go to Jennifer Vanell of Badger Studios for musical arrangement and performance. Kate Butt and Teresa Janison Cemetery Warriors and My Most Excellent Pals. And to interviewees, Brian Post of Standing Stone Landscape Architecture of Springfield, Vermont, and Jason Alden, Lauren Watros, and Paul Bowen of The Drawing Studio in Brattleboro, Vermont. We've got one more installment to go to wrap up this story, so hang in there. You're doing great. Enjoy this show on any of these podcast platforms. Apple Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and Radio Public.